morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to AP U.S. History, as today we look at how the North wins the Civil War. Now, the most famous battles of the Civil War, those that get the most attention, were fought primarily in the Eastern Theater, by which we mainly mean Northern Virginia. Um, but some historians would argue the war was really won by the armies in the West, and the Western Theater essentially means everything outside Northeastern Virginia at least everything between the Appalachian Mountains and the Mississippi, fighting beyond the Mississippi being known as the Trans-Mississippi Department. Um, and while the Anaconda Plan was slow, it was sure. As 1862 passed, the blockade was beginning to work. The North now had to take the Mississippi River, meaning the, or the entire Mississippi Valley, including the Cumberland River and the Tennessee. As part of the plan to take the Mississippi River and the Upper South in general, Ulysses S. Grant attacked Fort Henry on the Tennessee River on February 6, 1862. Ten days later, took Fort Donelson on the Cumberland with the help of Union gunboats sailing off the Ohio River um, onto its Confederate tributaries. The Confederate commander at Fort Donelson had once lent Grant money when he was in trouble and expected some mercy now. Grant, however, demanded unconditional surrender and got it February 16, 1862, making Grant famous, causing people to claim his initials, U.S., stood for unconditional surrender. And not only did taking these two forts protect the Ohio River, but it let the U.S. forces take Nashville, the first of many Confederate capitals to fall. And as Tennessee's governor, a pro-secessionist by the name of Harris, um, had fled to join the Confederate Army. Um, Tennessee needed a new governor, and Abraham Lincoln appointed the most prominent Southerner to remain loyal to the Union, Andrew Johnson, a senator from East Tennessee, um, and former governor of Tennessee, and a pretty good one, a former congressman, state legislator, uh, and mayor of Greenville. Now, from Fort Donelson, Grant marched toward the Mississippi River, leading his Army of the Tennessee. Um, along the way, he ran into the Confederate Army of Mississippi, commanded by Albert Sidney Johnston. Um, or rather, Johnston ran into him as, uh, on April 6, 1862, Johnston's army surprised Grant's men um, near a small church uh, named Shiloh, um, in some cases overrunning the camps of Grant's soldiers while they were still cooking their breakfast, and the hungry Confederates stopped to eat the Union soldiers' bacon. The Battle of Shiloh was fought near the small town of Pittsburgh Landing, um, and occasionally will be referred to by that name too, though very rarely. The United States uh, then fielded the Army of the Tennessee, which would later be joined by the Army of the Ohio. Once combined, they had just over 65,000 men, although not that many, again when they were first attacked by the Army of Mississippi, which had just under 45,000 men. When the first attack came, most of the Yankees ran, but General Prentiss's division held out valiantly for most of the day in a sunken road that formed sort of a natural trench, which came to be called the Hornet's Nest after the buzzing of bullets overhead. Eventually, though, after being pounded by artillery, um, most were killed, the rest captured. But this did slow down uh, the Confederate forces. The rest of Grant's men, though, were pushed all the way to the edge of the Tennessee River. However, during the fighting, General Johnston uh, was, in, was wounded, a uh, shot in the back of the leg. Uh, his, he had a personal surgeon, but he had sent his surgeon off to tend to Union prisoners. At first, he thought the wound wasn't too serious, but it had struck an artery um, behind his knee, uh, and he bled to death, and was replaced, for the moment, by Pierre Beauregard, who had been sent west. Beauregard tends to bounce around different parts of the Civil War. Um, I believe it was due in part to bad health, um, so he often did have to uh, take rest breaks from the war, but also, like many generals, he did not get along with President Davis. And I think that contributed to his frequent reassignments, too. Um, and Beauregard was not able to completely crush Grant um, that first day of the battle, and overnight, Reinforcements arrived, and commanded by General Don Carlos Buell, um, 
he and his army of the Ohio would help Grant to fight back the next day um, in intense, bloody conflict. By the end of April 7th, 1862, more men had died in this single battle um, than all previous American wars combined. Total casualties killed and wounded, north and south, were 23,746, 13,000 from the north, um, 10,699 from the south. And while Grant won the battle in the end, some of Lincoln's advisors wanted Grant relieved of command because of the shock of this unprecedented death toll. Um, at least unpre unprecedented to that point, it will be matched and more in many later battles. But Lincoln refused to remove Grant, saying he needed a man who would fight, Grant being a real contrast to George McClellan, um, who at this point was bogged down uh, in the peninsula outside of Yorktown. After this difficult victory, um, the United States went on to capture Memphis, Tennessee, and then moved down the Mississippi River in hopes of capturing Vicksburg, um, a fortified city on a bluff overlooking the Mississippi River. Without gaining control of this city, the North would not be able to control the entire Mississippi River. Grant would try unsuccessfully to attack Vicksburg um, from different angles through the nearly impassable swamps around it over the next 14 months. Now again, Beauregard, due in part to health problems, um, was, uh, was reassigned and replaced in command of the Army of Mississippi by Braxton Bragg, um, a friend of Jefferson Davis, the two having fought um, very bravely um, at Buena Vista uh, in the Mexican War, indeed both playing a very large role uh, in American forces winning that battle. Bragg renamed his Army of Mississippi the Army of Tennessee. Um, Bragg, though, had many critics. Many of his officers considered him incompetent, tyrannical, possibly insane, uh, sometimes would not follow his orders. Eventually set, set up an entire petition to request his removal all the officers signing in a circle around the edge of the document, so none of them would, could be accused of having signed first. On the whole, his men did not like him either, and he's generally been regarded as a poor general. Some people blamed him for the South's loss of the war. All this may not be entirely fair. He did have some men and officers who felt he did the best he could with what he had, and his resources were always more limited. Um, um, reinforcements and resupply uh, were mostly concentrated in the Eastern Theater and where the fighting near Richmond um, in Washington, D.C. got the most attention. Um, now in the fall of 1862, or late summer um, and fall, as Lee marched into Maryland, uh, Braxton Bragg marched into Kentucky and first did perform moderately well. Um, but, like Lee, was eventually fought to a draw, in this case at Perryville, um, from which he chose to retreat following uh, his losses. Moving back to Murfreesboro, not too far from Nashville, were in a battle also sometimes known as Stones River um, from December 31st, 18, 1862 to January 2nd, 1863. Um, he was defeated by William Rosecrans. Rosecrans had about 44,000 men, Bragg had about 37,000, um, and Bragg, after this defeat, was forced to retreat to Chattanooga, um, thus giving up pretty much all of Middle Tennessee um, and West Tennessee to the Union. Casualties at Stones River um, were uh, 23,500, and more for the North than for the South, but the North could spare a few more. And again, um, Bragg had to retreat to Chattanooga. This victory boosted the morale of the army of Ulysses S. Grant, in who had repeatedly failed to capture Vicksburg. Um, seven attempts to attack had failed, again, partly due to the Confederates' defense, partly due to the swampy terrain surrounding the city, making it hard for the Union to even approach Vicksburg. Um, Many men died of disease in this swampy environment. But finally, on May 18, 1862, Grant had managed to move enough men up to the town to besiege Vicksburg, 
and bombard the city constantly with artillery fire. People began living in improvised bomb shelters dug in the ground, so that some Union soldiers, um, seeing them pop up out of their holes, called the place Prairie Dog Town. As they began to starve, they were reduced to eating horses and even rats. And so on July 4th, 1863, after a month and a half of siege, the city surrendered on the same day that Lee began his retreat from Gettysburg. With the fall of Vicksburg, the Mississippi River belonged to the Union again. And the day of their surrender, July 4th, would not be celebrated as a holiday in Vicksburg again uh, until World War II. And the Union capture of Vicksburg, Lee's defeat at Gettysburg, coming um, at, in early July, almost on the same day, have led many people to view these twin events as the turning point of the war. And militarily, that's probably correct. Others have pointed to the Battle of Antietam um, as, uh, as the true turning point because this allowed Lincoln to issue the Emancipation Proclamation, making the war openly about freeing slaves and thus keeping Europeans um, from helping the South. So this may have been a turning point diplomatically and morally. Now, at this point, Lee did decide he needed to help Bragg and sent some of his men under the command of James Longstreet out west. But Longstreet, like so many of the men who already served under Bragg, um, didn't like him much. Indeed, helped to organize that petition in hopes of having him removed. Um, still, when the U.S. Army approached Chattanooga, Longstreet and Bragg worked together well enough. Um, as the Confederate Army did pull back from Chattanooga, but not far. Um, Rosecrans pursued them to a little creek called the Chickamauga, just over the border uh, in Georgia. On September 18, 1862, um, Rosecrans, having pursued Bragg, was then attacked by Bragg. Um, at first, Rosecrans held the line um, following his attack on September 18, but September 19, Rosecrans was told there was a gap in his line. He got misinformation. Um, he sent men to fill that gap, but in doing so, he opened up a real gap. Longstreet's men rushed into the breach, disrupting the Federal Army, so they retreated all the way back to Chattanooga. Although some have criticized Bragg for not pursuing them harder, had he done so, he might have completely defeated them. Although his attempts to follow them were partly unblocked, by Union General George Thomas, nicknamed the Rock of Chickamauga. Um, the battle was, was uh, a very bloody one. Indeed, a legend um, has developed that Chickamauga is an Indian word meaning river of death. Although I think that's not really true. The battle claimed close to 35,000 casualties, um, 16,000 for the North, 18,500 for the South. Now, Lincoln also sent one of his generals west. Ambrose Burnside went west in 1863. In September of 1863, seized the oldest town in, in Tennessee, um, the town of Jonesboro, um, to seize this town's strategic supply of salt. Lincoln, though, viewed this as a waste of the Army's time and resources, instead of Jonesboro. Jonesboro? Damn, Jonesboro. And from there, Burnside moved to the larger um, city of Knoxville. Uh, an important railroad hub, um, and began fortifying a, a hill um, just north of the University of Tennessee. James Longstreet was sent to drive Burnside out. Um, and the Battle of Fort Sanders um, on November 29, 1863, um, Longstreet would suffer an embarrassing loss. Of course, the fort was on top of a hill. Burnside's men had dug a trench around the fort, a moat, really, and furthermore, strung telegraph line on low po uh, posts about ankle height um, on the ground in front of the moat, um, sort of taking the role that barbed wire would take in the First World War. Longstreet attempted a night attack, something very rare in the Civil War. Uh, in the darkness, his men did not see those telegraph wires uh, and got tangled up in them, tripping all over the place. Those who got close to the fort fell in the moat, um, and the men on the wall shot them down. Longstreet and his men eventually retreated in shame.
In October of 1863, Ulysses S. Grant was given overall command of the Western armies, and he went to Chattanooga um, and began to attack the Confederates surrounding the town uh, on November 23, 1863. On the 24th, Union forces took Lookout Mountain. Um, and on the 25th, they captured Missionary Ridge. Um, and Confederate forces then retreated from Chattanooga into Georgia. All of Tennessee was now occupied by the Union. And at long last, on December 27, 1863, President Davis was finally convinced to replace his old friend Braxton Bragg with Joseph Johnston uh, to take command of the Army of Tennessee, um, which no longer occupied Tennessee. Johnston's task would be to prevent Grant from pushing into Georgia. Although, in fact, it wouldn't be Grant he would face, um, because Grant was soon promoted to commanding general of the U.S. Army and brought back east in March of 1864. Um, as his replacement in the West, he chose his friend, um, William Tecumseh Sherman, who, if anything, would prove even more tenacious than Grant. And these two generals devised a plan for the Army. Well, in many ways, this was simply carrying out the final step in the Anaconda Plan. The southern coast had been blockaded for years. The Mississippi River had finally been conquered um, and cut, cutting the south in half. At last, it was time to go on to Richmond um, and, so, and, and elsewhere into the southern interior. So, in 1864, Ulysses S. Grant um, leading the Army of the Potomac, with George Meade still technically in command, but Grant riding with him and basically giving all the orders, um, sidelining Meade. Lincoln always resenting Meade because he had not um, pursued Lee's retreating army after Gettysburg, although an accusation some historians think is not entirely fair. Perhaps true, but not um, entirely considering the, um, all the circumstances at the time. Um, so Grant moves into Virginia uh, in mid-1864. His army was much larger than Lee's, but Lee's men were mostly veterans, Grant's mostly new recruits. And Ed Grant was not often a brilliant commander in the field. He would end up killing thousands of men in frontal assaults. But he did so because unlike George McClellan, Grant could do math. And he understood that the North had more men to spare. Um, when Grant's invasion of Virginia began, he had 123,000 men, Lee about 65,000, and Grant knew his men could be replaced, while Lee's largely could not. The two armies first faced off in what's known as the Battle of the Wilderness, um, not too far from Chancellorsville. This is actually a series of battles and skirmishes, very intense fighting in the woods, so intense that the discharge from some of the guns set the dry woods on fire. Some men were burnt to death and the forest fire started during the battle. Um, or series of battles lasting from May 2nd to May 6th, 1864. Um, all there were some other skirmishes both before and after that period. Grant lost over 17 and a half thousand men killed and wounded. Lee over 10,000 less, just 7,500. But Grant refused to retreat. In the peninsula, McClellan had won battles and run away. Grant lost battles um, and marched onwards, uh, moving to the east and to the south to try to get around Lee's army, forcing Lee to pull back to defend Richmond and keep between that city and Grant's army, uh, which he did again, um, digging in uh, on a series of hills near Spotsylvania Courthouse. Um, here, fighting lasted from uh, May 8th to May 19th, um, and with Grant sending repeated charges against fortified positions, taking 18,000 casualties, although inflicting 12,000, but not seizing the battlefield, Lee's men holding those fortified positions. But, um, having lost another battle, Grant advanced again, um, to the south and to the east, moving by the left flank where Lee would try to stop him again at Cold Harbor, again in a strongly fortified position. Um, Cold Harbor, the Union lost 13,000 men 
Lee just 2,600 killed and wounded, bringing the total casualties um, since uh, the campaign had begun at the beginning of May to uh, 52,000 men killed and wounded for Grant, less than half that, 23,000 for Lee. Um, in Cold Harbor was the most infamous instance of this. Fighting was so intense that 7,000 men died in less than an hour. Grant came to be seen as a butcher, um, but did learn um, not to attack Confederate fortifications again. Still, Grant was viewed as a monster, as a butcher by many people in the North. Many called for his removal, but Lincoln stood by him, happy to have a general who would keep attacking, and understanding, as Grant did, that sad as it was, they could spare the men. And after this terrible loss, Grant advanced again. Um, Lee ran before him to stay between him and Richmond, and finally dug in at Petersburg, a major rail hub just south of Richmond, building trenches around the city. Trenches Grant, for the most part, would not attack, planning instead a siege as long as it took. And it took from June 15, 1864 to April 2, 1865. There were a few attacks on the Confederate lines to test them here and there, and a serious attempt to break through, at least um, serious but almost comical if it were not so tragic, what is known as the Battle of the Crater, when Union engineers dug a tunnel beneath the Confederate trenches um, and set off a huge blast of gunpowder, blowing a huge crater in Confederate lines and then rushing into that gap. But the crater was so big and so deep um, the Union forces ended up trapped in the crater they had created, not having brought scaling ladders to get back out, um, and were cut down. This attack, um, under the command of Ambrose Burnside, would be the end of Burnside's military career, although he would later go on to be governor of Rhode Island and the first president of the National Rifle Association, having himself invented a type of rifle prior to the Civil War, which his men sometimes used. Um, should you visit the small museum in the basement um, of um, on one of the buildings, University of Tennessee, they have on display a large collection of uh, Burnside bullets used in the Battle of Fort Sanders. Um, this battle incident was July 30th, 1864. But Grant did not keep all his men around Petersburg. He sent General Philip Sheridan, a hero of the Battle of Missionary Ridge, um, into the Shenandoah Valley, um, a fertile grain-producing region in western Virginia where Sheridan burnt fields full of crops as well as barns, mills, courthouses, uh, and other buildings. He killed or confiscated livestock, captured the city of Winchester, and defeated every Confederate army sent to stop him. Now as Grant pushed into Virginia in the east, out west, Sherman began to march toward Atlanta. Um, which he viewed um, as his real enemy in the war. It was one of the South's few industrial centers. It was an important rail hub. As a manufacturing center, it produced many cannons for the South. Sherman claimed that so many cannons that his men had captured um, were stamped Atlanta, that he felt he'd been fighting Atlanta the whole war. Of course, the Confederate armies tried to stop him. Um, and he faced... Um, the army under Joseph Johnston. His army was also harassed by two Confederate cavalry commanders, um, Nathan Bedford Forrest and, and Joseph Wheeler, um, both very able cavalry commanders. Um, Joe Wheeler, many years later, um, would actually join the U.S. Army and serve in the Spanish-American War, being the only man to achieve the rank of general in both the Confederate and U.S. armies. Um, and they slowed Sherman down but they didn't stop him. Um, doing a pretty, still, they were doing a pretty good job with the limited number of soldiers and resources they had. But so in mid-summer, even late summer of 1864, Sherman and Grant were stalled outside their objectives. And of course, 1864 was an election year. Many Northerners were tired of the war, and especially after the unspeakable slaughter of Grant's campaigns in Northern Virginia. Um, and so Lincoln had to worry about party politics uh, and re-election. 
1864, the Democrats were split. Um, their, um, their most prominent leader, Stephen Douglas, had died in 1861. There really wasn't a party leader at this point. And while some Democrats supported the war, and so were known as War Democrats, others opposed it and were known as Peace Democrats. Um, and Peace Democrats wanted an end, even if that meant negotiations that might recognize Southern independence. Um, some of the most outspoken opponents of the war were, were Democrats known as Copperheads, named perhaps for the Copper Pennies. Um, with the head of liberty that some wore pinned to their, to their lapels, um, named perhaps too for the venomous snake. Um, and some copperheads opposing not just Lincoln, who they saw as a tyrant, uh, and the war, which they saw as wicked, but the federal government as a whole, claiming it was tyrannical and corrupt and in the pocket of New England industrialists. Um, and some copperheads would actively work against the war effort, even attempting to free Confederate prisoners held in the North. But Lincoln had opponents in his own party, too. Within his own cabinet, Sam and P. Chase thought he would be a better president. Um, so Lincoln finally decided to put him somewhere he could never cause trouble, um, naming him Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, as we can see in his robes there. Um, knowing once he was in that role, he would never campaign for election again. Um, plus, we need a new Chief Justice, Roger B. Taney, having died late in 1863. Um, Lincoln wanted to unify the North, and so um, he ran not as the Republican candidate specifically, but rather as the head of a fusion party. The Union Party, they called it, made up of Republicans and war Democrats. And, um, to balance the ticket with a pro-war Democrat, he pushed aside his old vice president, whom he had largely ignored anyway, replacing Hannibal Hamlin with Andrew Johnson um, from Tennessee, the most prominent Southern Democrat to have remained loyal. The Democrats nominated George McClellan and on a platform that planned to end the war. And Little Mac was still popular with many of his old soldiers. It was feared that the army would vote with him. In the election of 1864, Lincoln told voters, don't change horses in the middle of the stream. He told soldiers, vote as you shot. In other words, against those traitorous rebel Democrats. But he wasn't sure he could win. Many of Lincoln's cabinet advised him to simply postpone or cancel the election, calling it an emergency of war. But while Lincoln had been willing to bend the law here and there and violate civil liberties from time to time, he refused to even consider canceling the election. And then, as summer progressed, several things happened to boost Lincoln's popularity uh, and support for the war. August 5th, 1864, uh, Admiral David Farragut um, captured Mobile, Alabama, closing off another Confederate port to blockade runners. During the attack, or before the attack, Farragut had been warned that torpedoes, um, which is a term then simply for an explosive, a floating mine, or even a mine buried underground, um, that torpedoes lay in the water um, in Mobile Bay. Farragut gave his famous line, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead, and seized Mobile, August 5th, 1864. Of course, in this Shenandoah Valley, Philip Sheridan was destroying everything that he could and continued to do so from August of 1864 until April of 1865. Um, out west, Jefferson Davis was angry that Joseph Johnston was retreating from Sherman rather than attacking him. He was retreating Sherman and delaying him with reasonable effectiveness, but again not stopping or reversing his invasion of Georgia. And indeed, Sherman did finally push to the edge of Atlanta. Johnston was holding the city, though, when he was replaced by John Bell Hood, um, who had been a very brave general um, in the East and later in the West. He'd fought bravely at Antietam. Um, he'd been shot in, in the arm, which was paralyzed um, at Gettysburg. He had a leg shot off at Chickamauga. But now he was back in service. A, a very aggressive commander. 
and Hood was impressed by Sherman's advance into enemy territory um, without supplies or support, but living off the land. And he decided he could do the same thing, that he would move into Tennessee, trying to liberate that state and hopefully get Sherman to follow him uh, and take the pressure off Atlanta. Um, oh, he abandoned Atlanta. Hood abandoned Atlanta um, September 1st, 1864, um, and headed into Tennessee. Sherman was happy to see him go. He said if Hood would go all the way to the Ohio, he'd give him the rations to do it. And September 7th, 1864, Sherman captured Atlanta. Lincoln at last had some victories to show the American people. In November, um, he gave furloughs to as many soldiers as he could, telling them to go home and vote. Others were allowed to cast absentee ballots for the first time in American history, mailing them in from the trenches around Petersburg and elsewhere. Lincoln won the election with about 55% of the popular vote, but almost the entire electoral vote, 212 to 21. And um, not long afterwards, November 16th, 1864, Sherman burned Atlanta to the ground, destroying the factories there um, and beginning his famous march to the sea, designed to terrorize the South um, and destroy both their supplies and their will to use it. Whereas up in Tennessee, um, General Hood um, suffered two major defeats. Um, at Franklin, Tennessee, on November 30th, 1864, um, he lost over 6,000 men compared to just over 2,000 Union soldiers. Among Hood's casualties were 15 of the 28 generals under his command. Um, including one viewed as one of his most capable, Patrick Claiborne. Um, although a controversial one, having immigrated from Ireland relatively recently, he was an anti-slavery Confederate general, um, a pretty rare sort of figure in the South, and now a dead one. From there, Hood moved on to attack Nashville, December 16, 1864, with the 21,000 troops remaining to him, and they were completely destroyed. No one knows for sure how many men he lost, probably 18 or 19,000 killed, wounded, or captured. Many ended up in northern prison camps where they often suffered from starvation. The North have eventually deciding to stop feeding its prisoners properly in revenge for the South also not feeding its prisoners. The difference being the South didn't have much food to spare. The North had it, but sometimes chose to withhold it. Um, Hood resigned his command, such as it was, January 23rd, 1865, and General Johnston was put back in command of whatever armies he could scrape up to try to stop Sherman. And a question was posed to me some years ago by a student, was Hood on drugs? And the answer was yes. Um, he was dependent on painkillers, primarily the opiate known as laudanum. Um, following, again, his uh, bad injury at Gettysburg that had paralyzed his left arm and the loss of his right leg at Chickamauga. Um, the, the Confederate diary writer, um, Mary Chestnut, said of Hood that people spoke of him as if he was a centipede, counting up how many legs he had. And while Hood was destroying his own army in Tennessee, Sherman was marching through Georgia in burning, looting, and destroying on the way to make war so terrible that no one in the South would fight anymore. Um, it was not entirely clear where he was, though, as his men destroyed telegraph lines around the way. Um, they tore up railroad tracks, too, often piling up the sleeper ties to make bonfires, heating the rails red hot, and then wrapping them around trees or telegraph poles and calling the, uh, the twisted up rails Sherman's neckties. But Sherman appeared. Um, on December 22, 1864, and captured the city of Savannah, offering it to Lincoln as his Christmas present. Oh, with Atlanta destroyed and Lincoln re-elected, the North had basically won the war. It was just a matter of time until Grant could get past the trenches um, south of Petersburg and capture that city and at last move on to Richmond. And as the siege continued, Sherman continued to blaze a trail of destruction. 
as in January 1865, he left Savannah behind and left it intact, um, although with an occupying force. Then he moved into South Carolina. Um, and if his men had been harsh in Georgia, foraging for food and killing anyone who tried to stop them, they had a special hatred for South Carolina, who, which they blamed for starting the war. Some also blamed the radical abolition of, Mass of Massachusetts. Some said they would have burnt Massachusetts too if they could, but Massachusetts wasn't convenient, and South Carolina was right there. So they destroyed everything in a hundred mile path, a hundred mile wide strip across the state, including the capital, Columbia, which was burned on February 17, 1865. March 9, 1865, Sherman's men moved into North Carolina, again leaving behind a path of total destruction a hundred miles wide across South Carolina. Um, and in North Carolina, they continued to be destructive, but without the same vengeance and hatred they had felt in South Carolina. Military historians often view Sherman's march as brilliant, amazing for the speed with which it covered the swampy, river-filled terrain of South Carolina's low country, um, seen as innovative. Um, while in the past, armies had often lived off the land, the large armies formed in the 1700s and early 1800s, such as Napoleon's army, had ended up carrying most of their supplies with them. And to uh, not rely on supplies um, was seen as daring um, and innovative, or by his enemies, barbaric. And Sherman's destruction would be one of many reasons the South would be so slow in reconciling with the North. Sherman was opposed by a number of different generals with much smaller forces during this campaign, including by Joseph Johnston, uh, and who had been given command of whatever he had scraped up, scrape up um, after Hood's defeats. But unfortunately for the South, there just wasn't much left. Now as the South declined, Francis Blair, um, one of Lincoln's advisors and the father of his first postmaster general, unofficially offered the South a plan of peace and reunification, possibly through a war with Mexico. Um, nothing unites us like a common enemy. The Confederate government wanted peace, but did not want reunification, but agreed to a meeting with Secretary of State Henry Seward on February 3, 1865. At the last minute, Lincoln decided to go too, and met with three Confederate commissioners, including Alexander Stevens, the Vice President of the Confederacy, an old friend of Lincoln's from before the war. Um, they met at Hampton Roads, Virginia, uh, on a steamboat named the River Queen, a uh, U.S. Army transport. Lincoln offered to end the war if the South would accept the 13th Amendment, end hostilities, disband the Confederate Army, and of course rejoin the Union as states in the Union. In return, Lincoln hinted, although he never made any promises on paper, hinted he would use his presidential pardon to protect Confederates from imprisonment, he might even be able to offer $400 million in partial compensation for emancipated slaves. Um, and of course, accepting the 13th Amendment would mean emancipating all the slaves. $400 million would only have been about 15% of the value of all the South slaves when the war had begun, but um, better than nothing. Indeed, Lincoln even possibly hinted, although almost everything we know about this comes from recollections of Alexander Stevens written some years later, Lincoln perhaps even hinted the ratification of the 13th Amendment might not be an absolute condition. But Southern leaders saw this offer, based on the certainty of their defeat, as demeaning, and even at this late date, somehow hoped to win independence and refused to make peace on these terms. But around Petersburg, Lee had very slowly been losing men, as Grant did bombard his lines and test them with little skirmishes here and there, and Lee simply could not replace his men anymore. And indeed, in late March and early April of 1865, Grant's army did make several attacks against the thinly defended lines around Petersburg, destroying much of Lee's reserve. Um, and so, Lee retreated um, over the night, 
uh, of April 2nd to April 3rd, 1865. Richmond was evacuated at the same time. Some parts burned to keep vital supplies out of Union hands. Now, on April 3rd, 1865, Petersburg and Richmond were occupied by the Union. Lee moved west, but was soon surrounded by the U.S. Army at Appomattox Courthouse. Uh, of his old Corps commanders, only one was left. Stonewall Jackson was long dead. Um, Jeb Stewart had been killed at Yellow Tavern in 1864. A.P. Hill killed just a couple days before at Five Forks. Baldy Ewell had been captured on the retreat from Richmond. Only James Longstreet, who himself had been wounded in the wilderness, remained. Of his once great army, there may have been 28,000 men left, but desertions continued every day. He wasn't really sure how many men he had left. He only knew he couldn't feed the men he still had. And so on April 9, 1865, he offered to surrender to Grant. Grant was generous um, in victory, saying he would let all the Confederates go home and not to prison camps. They could keep their horses and their mules to work their farms. Confederate officers could keep their pistols as a mark of respect. Grant even provided rations to Lee's starving army. And the surrender formally took place April 12, 1865, in the home of Wilmer McLean, who previously had lived at Manassas, Virginia, where his home was used as Beauregard's headquarters in the first major battle of the war. General Johnston would surrender to General Sherman on April 26, 1865, and get terms at least as lenient as those Grant gave to Lee. Indeed, the two men would become good friends after the war. Um, Johnston attended Sherman's funeral, and as a mark of respect, refused to wear his hat um, as the casket was carried through the rain, saying Sherman would have done the same for him. Although perhaps that was a bad choice on Johnston's part, he caught cold and died just a few days later. With Johnston's surrender, the war was essentially over, although some fighting would continue um, into, into May, um, even into June. Um, June 2nd, 1865, General Kirby Smith officially surrendered the Confederate Army of the Trans-Mississippi. Um, on June 19th, 1865, Union General Gordon Granger uh, occupied Galveston, Texas, and there announced the end of slavery in Texas, where many slaves were still aware, unaware, unaware of the Emancipation Proclamation that had been issued almost three years earlier. And this action, um, which freed the last Confederate slaves on June 19th, came to be celebrated in Texas and eventually across the country as Juneteenth. The last Confederate general to surrender was the Cherokee leader, Stan Watty, who surrendered June 23, 1865. All the very last Confederates to surrender and lay down their arms was the crew of CSS Shenandoah, a commerce raider built in England, um, which sailed all the way around the world, attacking Union shipping um, before returning to England um, and surrendering in Liverpool, November 6, 1865 many of her crew remaining there for years, fearing they might be hanged as pirates should they return home. At long last, the war was over.